The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery Section 39 She must write a note. The imp in the back of her mind laughed. In every story she had ever read, when a runaway life decamped from home she left a note, generally on the pincushion. It was not a very original idea, but one had to leave something intelligible. What was there to do but write a note? She looked vaguely about her for something to write with. Ink? There was none. Valency had never written anything since she had come to the Blue Castle, save memoranda of household necessaries for Barney. A pencil sufficed for them, but now the pencil was not to be found. Valancy absently crossed to the door of Bluebeard's chamber and tried it. She vaguely expected to find it locked, but it opened unresistingly. She had never tried it before, and did not know whether Barney habitually kept it locked or not. If he did, he must have been badly upset to leave it unlocked. She did not realize that she was doing something he had told her not to do. She was only looking for something to write with. All her faculties were concentrated on deciding just what she would say and how she would say it. There was not the slightest curiosity in her as she went into the lean-to. There were no beautiful women hanging by their hair on the walls. It seemed a very harmless apartment, with a commonplace little sheet-iron stove in the middle of it, its pipe sticking out through the roof. At one end was a table or counter crowded with odd-looking utensils, used no doubt by Barney in his smelly operations. Chemical experiments, probably, she reflected dully. At the other end was a big writing desk and swivel chair. The side walls were lined with books. Valancy went blindly to the desk. There she stood motionless for a few minutes, looking down at something that lay on it. A bundle of galley proofs. The page on top bore the title, Wild Honey, and under the title were the words, By John Foster. The opening sentence. Pines are the trees of myth and legend. They strike their roots deep into the traditions of an older world. But wind and star love their lofty tops. What music when old Aeolus draws his bow across the branches of the pines? She had heard Barney say that one day when they walked under them. So Barney was John Foster. Valency was not excited. She had absorbed all the shocks and sensations that she could compass for one day. This affected her neither one way nor the other. She only thought, so this explains it. It was a small matter that had, somehow, stuck in her mind more persistently than its importance seemed to justify. Soon after Barney had brought her John Foster's latest book, she had been in a Port Lawrence bookshop and heard a customer ask the proprietor for John Foster's new book. The proprietor had said curtly, Not out yet. Won't be out till next week. Valancy had opened her lips to say, Oh, yes, it is out, but closed them again. After all, it was none of her business. She supposed the proprietor wanted to cover up his negligence in not getting the book in promptly. Now she knew. The book Barney had given her had been one of the author's complimentary copies, sent in advance. Well, Valency pushed the proofs indifferently aside and sat down in the swivel chair. She took up Barney's pen, and a vile one it was, pulled up a sheet of paper to her, and began to write. She could not think of anything to say except bald facts. Dear Barney, I went to Dr. Trent this morning and found out he had sent me the wrong letter by mistake. There never was anything serious the matter with my heart, and I am quite well now. I did not mean to trick you. Please believe that. I could not bear it if you did not believe that. I am very sorry for the mistake. 
but surely you can get a divorce if I leave you. Is desertion a ground for divorce in Canada? Of course, if there is anything I can do to help or hasten it, I will do it gladly, if your lawyer will let me know. I thank you for all your kindness to me. I shall never forget it. Think as kindly of me as you can, because I did not mean to trap you. Goodbye. Yours gratefully, Valency. It was very cold and stiff, she knew. But to try to say anything else would be dangerous, like tearing away a dam. She didn't know what torrent of wild incoherences and passionate anguish might pour out. In a postscript, she added, Your father was here today. He is coming back tomorrow. He told me everything. I think you should go back to him. He is very lonely for you. She put the letter in an envelope, wrote Barney across it, and left it on the desk. On it, she laid the string of pearls. If they had been the beads she believed them, she would have kept them in memory of that wonderful year. But she could not keep the $15,000 gift of a man who had married her out of pity, and whom she was now leaving. It hurt her to give up her pretty bauble. That was an odd thing, she reflected. The fact that she was leaving Barney did not hurt her. Yet. It lay at her heart like a cold, insensible thing. If it came to life, Valency shuddered and went out. She put on her hat and mechanically fed good luck and banjo. She locked the door and carefully hid the key in the old pine. Then she crossed to the mainland in a disappearing propeller. She stood for a moment on the bank, looking at her blue castle. The rain had not yet come, but the sky was dark and Mr. was gray and sullen. The little house under the pines looked very pathetic, a casket rifled of its jewels, a lamp with its flame blown out. I shall never again hear the wind crying over Mr. Wiss at night, thought Valancy. This hurt her, too. She could have laughed to think that such a trifle could hurt her at such a time. End of chapter 39「40. Valency paused a moment on the porch of the brick house in Elm Street. She felt that she ought to knock like a stranger. Her rosebush, she idly noticed, was loaded with buds. The rubber plant stood beside the prim door. A momentary horror overcame her, a horror of the existence to which she was returning. Then she opened the door and walked in. I wonder if the prodigal son ever felt really at home again, she thought. Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles were in the sitting room. Uncle Benjamin was there, too. They looked blankly at Valency, realizing at once that something was wrong. This was not the saucy, impudent thing who had laughed at them in this very room last summer. This was a gray-faced woman with the eyes of a creature who had been stricken by a mortal blow. Valency looked indifferently around the room. She had changed so much, and it had changed so little. The same pictures hung on the walls. The little orphan who knelt at her never-finished prayer by the bed, whereon reposed the black kitten that never grew up into a cat. The gray steel engraving of Quachibras, where the British regiment forever stood at bay. The crayon enlargement of the boyish father she had never known. There they all hung in the same places. The green cascade of Wandering Jew still tumbled out of the old granite saucepan on the window stand. The same elaborate, never-used pitcher stood at the same angle on the sideboard shelf. The blue and gilt faces that had been among her mother's wedding presents, still primly adorned the mantelpiece, flanking the china clock of Biros and besprayed ware that never went, the chairs in exactly the same places, her mother and cousin Stickles, 
likewise unchanged, regarding her with stony unwelcome. Valencia had to speak first. I've come home, mother, she said tiredly. So I see. Mrs. Frederick's voice was very icy. She had resigned herself to Valencia's desertion. She had almost succeeded in forgetting there was a Valencia. She had rearranged and organized her systematic life without any reference to an ungrateful, rebellious child. She had taken her place again in a society which ignored the fact that she had ever had a daughter and pitied her, if it pitied her at all, only in discreet whispers and asides. The plain truth was that, by this point, Mrs. Frederick did not want Valencia to come back, did not want ever to see or hear of her again. And now, of course, Valencia was here with tragedy and disgrace and scandal trailing after her visibly. So I see, said Mrs. Frederick. May I ask why? Because I'm not going to die, said Valancy huskily. God bless my soul, said Uncle Benjamin. Who said you were going to die? I suppose said Cousin Stickles shrewishly. Cousin Stickles did not want Valencia back either. I suppose you've found out he has another wife, as we've been sure all along. No, I only wish he had, said Valencia. She was not suffering particularly, but she was very tired. If only the explanations were all over, and she were upstairs in her old ugly room, alone just alone. The rattle of the beads on her mother's sleeves as they swung on the arms of the reed chair almost drove her crazy. Nothing else was worrying her, but all at once it seemed that she simply could not endure that thin, insistent rattle. My home, as I told you, is always open to you, said Mrs. Spedrick stonily. But... I can never forgive you. Valencia gave a mirthless laugh. I care very little for that if I could only forgive myself, she said. Come, come, said Uncle Benjamin testily, but rather enjoying himself. He felt he had Valencia under his thumb again. We've had enough of mystery. What has happened? Why have you left that fellow? No doubt there's reason enough. But what particular reason is it? Valencia began to speak mechanically. She told her tale bluntly and barely. A year ago, Dr. Trent told me I had angina pectoris and could not live long. I wanted to have some life before I died. That's why I went away. Why I married Barney. And now i found it is all a mistake. There is nothing wrong with my heart. I've got to live. And Barney only married me out of pity. So I have to leave him. Free. God bless me, said Uncle Benjamin. Cousin Stickles began to cry. Valencia, if only you had the confidence in your own mother. Yes, yes, I know, said Valencia impatiently. What's the use of going into that now? I can't undo this year. God knows I wish I could. I've tricked Barney into marrying me, and he's really Bernard Redfern, Dr. Redfern's son of Montreal, and his father wants him to go back to him. Uncle Benjamin made a queer sound. Cousin Stiggles took her black-bordered handkerchief away from her eyes and stared at Valencia. A queer gleam suddenly shot into Mrs. Frederick's stone-gray orbs. Dr. Redfern, not the purple pill man, she said. Valancy nodded. He's John Foster, too, the writer of those nature books. But, but, Mrs. Frederick was visibly agitated, though not over the thought that she was the mother-in-law of John Foster. Dr. Redfern is a millionaire! Uncle Benjamin shut his mouth with a snap. Ten times over, he said. Valencia nodded. Yes, Barney left home years ago, 
because of uh, some trouble, some disappointment. Now he will likely go back. So you see, I had to come home. He doesn't love me. I can't hold him to a bond he was tricked into. Uncle Benjamin looked incredibly sly. Did he say so? Does he want to get rid of you? No. I haven't seen him since I found out. But I tell you, he only married me out of pity. Because I asked him to. Because he thought it would only be for a little while. Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles both tried to speak, but Uncle Benjamin waved a hand at them and frowned portentously. Let me handle this. Wave and wave and frown seemed to say. To Valency. Well, well, dear, we'll talk it over later. You see, we don't quite understand everything yet. As Cousin Stickles says, you should have confided in us before. Later on, I dare say we can find a way out of this. You think Barney can easily get a divorce, don't you? Said Valency eagerly. Uncle Benjamin silenced with another wave, the exclamation of horror he knew was trembling on Mrs. Frederick's lips. Trust to me, Valency. Everything will arrange itself. Tell me this, Dossie. Have you been happy up back? Was Sna Mr. Redfern good to you? I have been very happy, and Barney was very good to me, said Valency, as if reciting a lesson. She remembered when she studied grammar at school, she had disliked the past and perfect tenses. They had always seemed so pathetic. I have been, it was all over and done with. Then don't worry, little girl. How amazingly paternal Uncle Benjamin was. Your family will stand behind you. We'll see what can be done. Thank you, said Valency, dully. Really, it was quite decent of Uncle Benjamin. Can I go and lie down a little while? I'm... I'm... tired. Of course you're tired. Uncle Benjamin patted her hand gently. Very gently. All worn out and nervous, go and lie down, by all means. You'll see things in quite a different light after you've had a good sleep. He held the door open. As she went through, he whispered, what is the best way to keep a man's love? Valencia smiled wanly, but she had come back to the old life, the old shackles. What? she asked as meekly as of yore. Not to return it, said Uncle Benjamin with a chuckle. He shut the door and rubbed his hands, nodded and smiled mysteriously round the room. Poor little Doss, he said pathetically. Do you really suppose that Snaith can actually be Dr. Redfern's son? gasped Mrs. Frederick. I see no reason for doubting it. She says Dr. Redfern has been there. Why, the man is rich as wedding cake. Amelia, I've always believed there was more in Doss than most people thought. You kept her down too much, repressed her. She never had a chance to show what was in her. And now she's landed a millionaire for a husband. But, hesitated Mrs. Frederick, he, he, they told terrible tales about him. All gossip and invention, all gossip and invention. It's always been a mystery to me why people should be so ready to invent and circulate slanders about other people they know absolutely nothing about. I can't understand why you paid so much attention to gossip and surmise. Just because he didn't choose to mix up with everybody, people resented it. I was surprised to find what a decent fellow he seemed to be that time. He came into the store with Balenci. I discounted all the yarns then and there. But he was seen dead drunk in Port Lawrence once, said Cousin Stickles. Doubtfully, yet as one very willing to be convinced to the contrary. Who saw him? demanded Uncle Benjamin drunkenly. Who saw him? Old Jimmy Strang said he saw him. I wouldn't take old Jimmy Strang's word on oath. He's too drunk himself half the time to see straight. He said he saw him lying drunk on a bench in the park. Psha! Redfern's been asleep there. Don't worry over that. 
But his clothes and that awful old car, said Mrs. Frederick uncertainly. Eccentricities of genius, declared Uncle Benjamin. You heard Doss say he was John Foster? I'm not up in literature myself, but I heard a lecturer from Toronto say that John Foster's books had put Canada on the literary map of the world. I suppose we must forgive her, yielded Mrs. Frederick. Forgive her? Uncle Benjamin snorted. Really, Amelia was an incredibly stupid woman. No wonder poor Doss had gone sick and tired of living with her. Well, yes, I think you'd better forgive her. The question is, will Snaith forgive us? What if she persists in leaving him? You've no idea how stubborn she can be, said Mrs. Frederick. Leave it all to me, Amelia. Leave it all to me. You women have muddled it enough. This whole affair has been bungled from start to finish. If you had put yourself to a little trouble years ago, Amelia, she would not have bolted over the traces as she did. Just let her alone. Don't worry her with advice or questions till she's ready to talk. She's evidently run away in a panic because she's afraid he'd be angry with her for fooling him. Most extraordinary thing of Trent to tell her such a yarn. That's what comes of going to strange doctors. Well, well, we mustn't blame her too harshly, poor child. Redfern will come after her. If he doesn't, I'll hunt him up and talk to him as man to man. He may be a millionaire, but Valencia is a sterling. He can't repudiate her just because she was mistaken about her heart disease. Not likely he'll want to. Doss is a little overstrung. Bless me, I must get in the habit of calling her Valencia. She isn't a baby any longer. Now, remember, Amelia, be very kind and sympathetic. It was something of a large order to expect Mrs. Frederick to be kind and sympathetic, but she did her best. When supper was ready, she went up and asked Valencia if she would like a cup of tea. Valencia, lying on her bed, declined. She just wanted to be left alone for a while. Mrs. Frederick left her alone. She did not even remind Valencia that her plight was the outcome of her own lack of daughterly respect and obedience. One could not exactly say things like that to the daughter-in-law of a millionaire. End of chapter 40